Welcome to Wild Call for Assembly of God Online. We're glad you've joined us today. You know, God gives hope to people. This is Back to Church Month, time of focusing on people coming back to church. Whether you're coming back to church online or whether you're coming back to church in person, we'd love to see you in person. That's part of our thought. But also, if you can't make it, we'd like you to join us online even more. You say, well, I'm already online. Well, why don't you give a call to somebody and say, why don't you join me in watching this program? Because I believe that God has something just for you. You know, we believe God has something for you today. God's got a plan for you. He's got some things in store. We're going to move into worship and praise. And Pastor Brian, Pastor Andrea, come lead us in worship and praise today. Joy in the house. 
yesterday was a very devastating thing that happened in our country. People couldn't even believe what they were watching and people definitely couldn't believe what they were seeing right there being in the Twin Towers or even in the Pentagon building or on the plane that went down in Pennsylvania. And our lives changed forever in many ways of what, how we do things, processes we now have to go through. And there are still people grieving. We want to uphold them, the families that lost loved ones, children that never knew their father or their mother. Their world was definitely forever changed. We want to lift them up in prayer today. Father, right now, some of them will, some of us will never know the pain of the people that lost loved ones in 9 11 tragedies. But Lord, I do pray the one we promised we'd never forget, and it's been 20 years. Lord, touch those family members. Touch them and comfort them once again as that, that day just becomes so much more vivid in their mind. Lord, comfort them, I pray. Strengthen them. Lord, I know many of them will be like, why? What's the sense in this, Lord? And we don't have those answers either. I know that you know, God, and you'll reveal those things at the proper time. But just rain down peace, I pray, in their hearts and their lives. Lord, where bitterness has taken root and even given birth and, and, and the, to the fruit of hatred, Lord, I pray that you would eradicate that out of that life. I'm not saying that they're, they don't have enough reason to feel that way, but Lord, hating someone or some ideology is never going to bring peace and help us to move forward. So root that out, I pray, but Lord, fill it with your love and your strength in their life. And Lord, restore hope to the one who thinks everything is hopeless. Restore hope, I pray in Jesus' name. May the darkness that's been surrounding them, may those dark clouds just disperse right now and may peace settle down around them in Jesus' name. Lord, we thank you for that. Lord, for those watching that have a need, Lord, maybe they need a job, maybe they, they need healing, maybe they need peace in their own life, or they need hope restored to them. God, do that work, I pray in Jesus' name. Lord, may they be strengthened in you today. May they be refreshed in you. May your presence just permeate and saturate wherever they're watching this at, Lord. And may it even be that they sense you right beside them. Maybe they'll even sense you wrapping your loving arms around them, Lord. God, for those that need that job, open doors. Help them to 
not just sit and wait at home for one to drop in their lap, but to get out and, and put feet to their prayers and walk and put in applications and, and answer ads or whatever, Lord God. Help them in that area we pray. And Lord, for those who are just sitting at home, not sure if they even want to come back to church, I pray that you begin to deal and tug at their heart. Lord, I know some stay home to stay well, and I totally understand that. But many have become so complacent, Lord, about just staying home because they think it's easier. But your word does tell us to not forsake not. That means to not stay home. Forsake not the assembling of ourselves together. Because, Lord, in corporate worship, there is strength that comes. In corporate worship, there is, there is a manifestation of your presence in, in such a more real and powerful way that healings and miracles take place, Lord God. Draw them back. In your name I pray, and I thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Know we've prayed for jobs we know that unemployment has been stopped we just really pray that you would be able to find a job to to secure employment once again because I know that without anything coming in I know it's difficult and if two people are on unemployment in the house that's even that's more difficult and so we just pray that, you know, we're going to continue to pray that God would just uh, show you even where to go to apply. But please know that we so often think we deserve something just dropped in our lap. And that's not usually, not always how God works. Sometimes he does expect us to put what we say feet to our prayer and go out there and put in applications. Go out there and knock on doors. Go in there and add, make phone calls and add, uh, answer ads you see. But trust him and ask him to guide you and he will guide you to the place where you're supposed to be working. Right. And, you know, this is going to sound, I'm not in any way trying to make you feel bad, but we also want to, at the same time, thank everyone who's been faithful in their giving. Right. That... Uh, through this time, we know some people have just even tied off their unemployment, you know, and and technically kind of you're supposed to, but, you know, that's between you and God, um, but have been faithful in their tithing and, and giving to missions and, and all of these things. And that does bring up another point that next week, the third Sunday of the month will be our mission Sunday. And so we always take an extra offering for missionaries and and pray for them, uh, for their needs that we're made aware of. And we know that there are many needs of the missionary that we don't know about, but some we do. But we just want to thank you for giving. And we're just going to ask the Lord right now to bless you. Lord, bless mm -hmm. those that have been faithful in their giving. Lord, even some of it probably could have, was maybe sacrificial. Bless them, I pray in Jesus' name. And Lord, those who who don't have anything to give but desire to give, then God, open up the windows of heaven and bless them so they can give. Lord, we don't ask to, to be blessed to get. Because your word says that it is more blessed to give than to receive. So Lord, we thank you that you are blessing those that have been faithful. Make provision for those who need employment, and I thank you that you'll guide them and direct their steps toward that. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Title is Hope God Has This. You know, this whole month we're talking about hope, hope. This is Back to Church Month, and we're praying that God brings you hope today. You know, Luke, the 12th chapter, verse 22 through 24 says, And he said to his disciples, Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you, what you will eat, nor about your body, what you'll put on. 
put on it. So that means your clothes you're going to put, put on there. For life is more than food and the body more than clothing. Consider the ravens. They neither sow nor reap. They have neither storehouse nor barn, and yet God feeds them. Of how much more value are you than birds? And which of you, being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? If then you are not able to do as small a thing as that, why are you anxious, anxious, anxious about the rest? You know, I was thinking today that I'm more valuable to God than a bird. That's right. God says, don't take any thought of worry. Don't fret over things. Don't let your mind be divided by thought. That's what worry talks about. Don't let your mind be divided by thought. Worry is that thought that struggles and chokes your joy, takes the life out of you, takes the air out of your lungs, takes away your peace, takes the joy from tomorrow, steals it away and doesn't allow you to enjoy that anymore. Jesus has just finished up talking about greed in Luke, the 12th chapter there. He talks about the guy building more barns because he doesn't have enough room for his stuff, so he has to build more just to handle his stuff. That's why in, in the verse up there, he talks about, <clears throat> uh, you know, you don't need to have all this extra, and the birds don't store all this extra, and the birds don't worry about the storehouse nor the barn, and yet God feeds them. So he's, he's trying to help them understand that since he's talked about this storing up and you have to build bigger barns because you need more stuff, because you need more food, you need to fret over things and make sure you have enough for the next 20 years. Sometimes we're, we're so concerned about all those things that we don't take time to enjoy the things that God has for us today. And that literally chokes the joy out of your life, it takes the life out of you, it takes the air out of your lungs. Jesus finished up talking about all those things and talked about, you know, that that guy that has all those things, he really doesn't have enough room for his stuff, so he has to build more just to handle his stuff. Greed says, I have to have more. That will not satisfy. Worry says, I may not have enough. The two together are incredible, yet the two oftentimes waver back and forth in somebody's thought pattern. Jesus says, don't worry about your life. It doesn't mean do nothing about your life. Let's get that straight right now. It doesn't mean sit at home and just expect somebody to give a knock on the door. Oftentimes here people say, well, you know, God's going to provide. God's going to provide. I'm just going to sit here and wait for something to come in the mailbox. That's not what it's talking about there. Not at all. It doesn't mean you don't prepare. It means that I don't let it get to the place where this worry or this concern or this greed controls my life. Worry can infiltrate the many details in your life. It's not that we aren't concerned about anything. Proverbs talks about the sluggard or slothful person. In other words, the person that is slow to respond to begin to do things. So concern and working with things is part of life. But it does mean I won't let these things control my thought life. In other words, is it controlling every time I, I think about something, I, I got to have this or I got to have that or I need to plan for this. And, and we sit there and our minds just go 90 miles an hour and we can't stop it down. And, and we may not need this or we may oh, and we go on and on. And Jesus in another story said the farmer sowed the seed and the plant was choked out by the weeds around it. It's the everyday stuff that can get us down. It's the worrying concern. It can choke the life out of us if we are not fruitful. And we can't become fruitful if we allow that thought process to control what we're talking about. You know, the 10 top worries in the U.S., according to USA Today, is number 10, moral decline. Number 9, immigration. Number 8, climate change. Number 7, taxes. Number six, health and health care. Number five is education. Number four is crime and violence. Number three, finances. Number two, unemployment. And number one, oh yeah, COVID. Yep, COVID. But Jesus says, don't worry. He doesn't say give respect to the problem. He doesn't say take care of and plan. 
He doesn't say plan for things in the future there. He doesn't say that. But rather, don't let it stop your fruitfulness. Don't let it stop your joy. Don't let it stop your happiness. If you're only thinking about those things and worry is taken over or greed is taken over and all you can do is focus on those things, then that's where it stops. It literally stops you down in your tracks. You know, worry and greed didn't come to the Garden of Eden. Pastor Becky talked about some of this last week. Until sin entered the garden. As soon as they ate, they didn't know what to wear. That's right. They didn't know what to eat. Who am I going to marry? Oh yeah, God had already worked that out for them. And yet they blamed God for all the details of their lives. They said God is going to get us because of what we've done. Joy had died in the garden. Stress had become prevalent. I need to hide because I don't know what to wear. I don't have anything right to wear. And I, I'm naked and I, I can't do this or whatever. You know, all those things began to stir there in the garden. Peace dies in the garden, all those things, and, and worry begins to come, and blame enters in, and, and strife and struggle and conflict came, and someone said this about uh, worry one time, a day of worry is more exhausting than a week of work. <laughs> worry is the dark room where negatives are developed. Worry is today's mice eating tomorrow's cheese. Wow. Arthur Roach said, Worry is a thin stream of fear trickling down the mind. If encouraged, it cuts a channel into which all the thoughts are drained. It lets fear trickle into the mind. The Apostle Paul says this, and over in the New Testament there, he says, everything with prayer and supplication. Do everything with prayer and supplication. And God wants us to exchange our worry for prayer. He wants to exchange even our desires. That's where the greed comes in. Our desires for prayer. Spend time with Him and know what God wants in my life. Worry can affect your entire body. Sometimes you worry because you have stuff. And sometimes you worry because you don't have stuff. Jesus said, don't worry because it has a negative effect on you. Now in Luke, the 12th chapter, verse 22 through 24, Jesus deals with worry desires and he tries to bring the hope in there he says uh he begins to deal with the ravens and we're going to talk about that in just a second but in philippians 4 8 it says let your reasonableness be known to everyone the lord is a hand don't be anxious for anything but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving let the request be made known to god the peace of god which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in christ jesus see in, gar in the garden peace left worry came jesus came and worry left by the way jesus came and worry left isaiah 43 1 and 2 says but now thus says the lord he who created you o jacob he who formed you o israel fear not for i have redeemed you and i have called you by name you are mine when you pass through the waters i will be with you and all and through the rivers and they shall not overcome, overwhelm you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, and the flames shall not consume you. See, the, the idea of waters there means the trouble or the circumstance you be in the face. I know we faced some floods here recently, but what water means there is these difficult situations. When you pass through it, it won't overwhelm you and take you to the place where you just can't do anything anymore. Water is pretty strong. It's a pretty strong current. It, it can move you. It can rearrange where you're even headed, your path, all your direction. It literally changes. When you walk through the fire, you won't get burned. See, God has a plan for your life. Notice, he says, when you walk through, it's, it's a key word there. When you walk through, Peter says, don't get upset about the fire tri trials you're going through. In other words, you're going to face some things. You're going to struggle as you go through some things, yes. But in that struggle, you have to learn where, at what point, and how do I begin to find my hope in God? How do I find my trust in God? And how do I find this basic premise? Do I trust God to really take care of me? Is my hope in the Lord? Adam and Eve didn't trust God. They felt like God was lying to them. God was holding, withholding information from them. That's what Satan told them. Satan told them that, you know, you need to be more like God. And if you eat this, then you're going to be more like God. That's what's going to happen. 
But they already were more like God before they ate that. Because there was no sin. There was no disobedience. There was none of that whatsoever. So they already had a better relationship with God. Distrust in God begins to create a void that, that literally our relationship with God just gets spread apart and we don't get close to God. But when I begin to trust in God, I draw closer to Him and I begin to understand who He is even more. But they were more like God in the, in the original time. They, they really didn't understand that. They were most happy before they ate in the, of the forbidden tree. Your best life is in Jesus. That's right. Your best life is in Jesus. Trouble may come. Lack of water may come. Floods may come. Jesus says, trust in him. Do I trust God to take care of me? Do I really trust that God's got a plan for my life, that, that he knows what I need to be wearing tomorrow? Does he know the details of my life? Does he know who I'm going to marry tomorrow? Does he know what relationships I should be involved in? Does he know all those things in my life? Trusting God is really trusting that he does that. So let's go back to that passage. I started to just jump in there a minute ago. In Luke the 12th chapter, verse 22 through 24, why ravens? Why does, why does God pick ravens in the story? Why does God pick ravens? You know, we started off by talking about that scripture verse. But let me just read it to you again. And it says, consider the ravens. They neither, neither sow nor reap. They neither have storehouse nor barn, and yet God feeds them. Huh. Consider the rapes. Why didn't God choose a dove to talk about? See, the doves were a clean bird, and you can eat them, but not a raven. In fact, when God says consider an unclean bird, wait a minute. That starts to give me hope because I'm not perfect either. A dirty bird, one, one that wasn't desired. The ravens don't have storehouses. They don't have offices or buildings. They don't, they don't have jobs particular. It's kind of a despicable bird. No value, useless birds. God used them over and over again. In Job, Job the 38th chapter, verse 41, who provides for the raven its prey? When its young ones cry to God for help and wonder, wonder about the lack of food, God takes care of the despicable birds. And the ravens were despicable birds in the Old Testament. Psalm 147 verse 9 says, He gives to the beasts their food and to the young ravens that cry. God takes care of them. It seems to be more valuable than anything else is this little raven. Not quite. Because God turns it around and says, Guess what? You're more valuable than that raven. And God takes care of those that may feel like they're unclean things. God takes care of the things that you rarely think about or could care less about. And in, this, in that picture, God says he cares for you. You are more valuable than a bird. See, the raven failed at a job of finding land in Noah's Ark. Why? I've oftentimes thought about that. However, a raven can eat the decaying flesh of dead animals. So when he set forth the raven to try to find land, what was happening? The raven was feeding off of dead carcasses laying on the water or whatever, and he would feed off the dead animals in the water. So the next thing he does is he sends out a dove because he knows the dove is not going to be like that. The dove is going to be very picky, very choosy. A dove, on the other hand, would return to his point of origin. And if no land was found, he would come back. Did you know that the ravens are against Levitical law? They could not eat them. They were unclean meat. Unclean meat. And God uses the ravens again to supply food to Elijah the prophet. Elijah was very destitute at a point in time and he ran and he was running from this this queen and as he ran and and found this place and he was literally by a brook area the ravens began to take care of him, brought him food every day got up look oh wow they're bringing me food but all of a sudden the brook dried up and when the brook dried up the ravens weren't bringing him food anymore so what did god do 
See, sometimes we look at our hope and our trust in God and say, all of a sudden it just dried up. God, where are you? You must not be caring about me. And immediately, we don't want to trust in God. But see, God had a second plan for Elijah the prophet. And his, the, the thing that God did, God says, okay, now Elijah, get up and go to the next town. Go to this town over here. And there's going to be a woman there. And you're going to ask her for some food. And she'll cook you a meal. And God chose somebody who was desolate at the time that Elijah, who had been desolate, to go to. This woman was desolate. She was on her getting ready to fix her last meal for her and her son. It seemed like she had no hope whatsoever. You know, God oftentimes uses people who have no hope to give hope to others that, and, and he does this thing back and forth, give hope to others that need hope too. So she's giving hope to this prophet Elijah, and he's asking for, for hope at the point in time. And God uses incredible ways just to turn things around. See, this woman cooks this last meal, and she follows Elijah's instruction. Elijah's instructions was simply, fix me a meal. God's going to take care of you. Don't worry. Fix me a meal. And give it to me first. That's going to be your test. There are times that God will test you in the area of hope. There are times that God will test you to see if you're going to follow through with what God wants you to do. God's going to test you. God sent him to the woman. The woman cooked her last meal for her and her son, gave a portion first to the prophet, and that jar that she had taken it out of, I can just imagine. Because after she took it out, she turned around, the jar was still had that much in there. She turned around and made another meal and looked around, and that jar still had that much in there. She turned around and, and fixed another meal, and that jar still, throughout the entire drought, God supplied the need. God says, don't take any thought for tomorrow. In other words, you don't have to hoard things to live for tomorrow. And, and, and you don't have to say, I, I need these things to make me more happy. I, it's not about that. It's, it's that God will supply. God will supply. And he'll supply some things incredible in your life. Jesus says, give us this daily bread. In other words, God has you on a daily basis. That's right. He has you on a daily basis. And when God supplies on a daily basis, he does things that are incredible. That doesn't mean I don't need to plan ahead for my future. It doesn't mean I don't need to plan ahead for some other things in my life. It just means I don't need to hoard it. It doesn't mean I need to, I need to stockpile it. It doesn't mean I need to have every, 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 everything. It, it's not about that. And I don't have to sit there and worry about where's the next meal going to come from. And when I finish, when I finish watching the service today, am I going to be able to have food on my table? What's going to happen? God has ways of supplying those needs. Remember that God used to supply the children of Israel that came out of captivity with a thing called manna? And God would drop manna down. They'd go out and collect the manna. But God's instructions to them was this. Only collect enough for you today. Now, when it came to the day of the Sabbath, they collected an extra bit for the day of the Sabbath. Now, there were some people that, that decided they would just hoard that a little bit. You know, I'm going to grab some extra just in case, you know, we, this, this manna doesn't come the next day. I'm just going to get some extra here. I'm going to get some extra just in case this and just in case, just in case. We're always on this just in case thing, you know. Those who hoarded it and got above what God said to do, they opened the manna up the next day. And the extra manna they had taken was full of maggots. That's right, full of maggots. Never before it happened that way, but it was full of maggots. In other words, God says, you're not trusting me. The daily bread on a daily basis is what God has planned for you. He's got some things planned for you. Quit worrying about all those details of how it's going to come out. Doesn't mean I don't need to do my part. Look for the job. Go out and do the job. It's not relying on the government saying, okay, the unemployment has stopped now. What are we going to do? It's not about those things whatsoever. It's trusting in God and going out and saying, God, where are you leading me today? And how am I going to find this job? And Lord, you lead and you guide and you open the door and help me to do the things I want, I'm supposed to do. You know, 
We don't need to hoard for the next pandemic. That's right. We don't need to hoard for the next pandemic. The next pandemic, will there be enough toilet paper? Will there be enough paper towels? The next snowstorm, and we'll probably have some coming this winter time. Will there be enough eggs? Will there be enough bread and milk? We're going to be snowed in for three or four days, and I've got to rush to the store, and I've got to get these extras right now, and I've got to make sure I have all the extra, all that I need. My hope is built on the fact that God will take care of me. That's hope. My daily bread. Jesus also says, consider the lilies, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin, yet I tell you, even Solomon, in all of his glory, was not arrayed like one of these. In other words, Solomon is this, this, this king we find in the Old Testament there, that had this glorious entourage of things and clothes and all the other things. And he had all these wonders and so much, and everybody looked at all of Solomon's stuff and said, wow, wow. But God says, if God so clothes the grass, which is alive in the fields today and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, how much more will he clothe you? Oh, you a little faith is what Jesus said. <laughs> wow. Oh, you a little faith. And do not seek what you do not, which, which you are to eat and what you are to drink, nor be worried. For all the nations of the world seek after these things and your father knows that you need them. Consider the lilies. Solomon in all his glory wasn't as beautiful as these, he says. For all of what he did doesn't equal the flowers that God clothes daily. Seek the kingdom. That's the final thing there. And that whole passage after he talks about filling your barns, it talks about that God's going to take care of the ravens and all the birds and, and God, you know, considers the lilies even greater all the way through. And then God says this, instead, seek the kingdom of God. And as you seek the kingdom of God, these things will be added unto you. These things will be added unto you. You said, my pastor, I'm struggling with some things right now. Well, God's got an answer for that. In Matthew 11, chapter, verses 28 through 30, it says, Come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. In other words, i got to trust in God. I have to trust in God. You know, there's another half of this situation, too. We talked about that lady that took care of the prophet. She literally reached out by faith and supplied the prophet with food. And Galatians 6, 2 says this, Bear one another's burdens. Bear one another's burdens. In other words, reach out for your brother or sister. Even though you feel like, I don't have a whole lot of extra, but I'll give a little bit more and give a little bit more and give a little bit more. And so fulfill the law of Christ. In other words, help someone. Help out someone. Instead of trying to just take care of you. My hope is built on the fact that I trust God to take me through and supply all my needs according to his riches and glory. That's hope. Wow. Hope God has this. That's right. God really has this. That's what hope is all about. Knowing that God really has all of this together. He's got a plan for your life. It may not look like it at the moment, but he really has a plan for your life. And trusting in him is an incredible, incredible thing that he wants us to do. Over and over again, we've shared with you several passages of scripture. You know, if God can care for a bird, he can care for you. That's right. You know, God shares that whole thought and the greed, the worry, all those things that we find clear back to <coughs> literally the place of the garden where it still it literally strangled out all the joy. God wants to bring those things, that joy, back to your life today. Can I pray with you, my friend? Lord, I just thank you for my friends today. And I, Lord, I ask that you just minister to them. 
as they just trusted you for that hope in their lives. Lord, reveal your hope. Help them to understand that you really have this in their life. Lord, they don't have to trust in other things, but they can trust in you to bring the hope and the joy back into their life. Lord, bring that satisfaction back there that needs to be brought back again. In Jesus' name I pray. Well, my friend, if you don't know Jesus today and you just like to accept him, I'd love to lead you that way. And it's very simple. Just say, Jesus, I'm sorry for my sin. Can you say that? Jesus, Jesus I'm, I'm sorry for my sin. sin. I ask you to forgive me of my sins. I ask you to forgive me of my sins. And Lord, that sin may be part of not trusting in you. And Lord, that sin may be part of not trusting in you. So help me to trust in you today. So help me to trust in you today. And know that you bring hope to my life. And know that you bring hope to my life. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. For coming in. For coming in. And changing my life. And changing my life. Amen. Amen. My friends, may the Lord bless you and keep you today. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. Lord, lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. That's my blessing I'd like to put on you that I find in Scripture. And I want that to be part of your life today. God bless you.